Here we are, back at it again, another episode of The Artistry of <laughs> It is I, your host, Bo Mile. Bo. No. I don't know, I can't. But, um, let's see what's been going on. What's been going on this week? Um, we're back, we're back at it with, um, with, with death. We have... An uncle that is looking, who has, you know, we don't know if he started the the sequence, but he's definitely, definitely, uh, definitely dancing, you know. So I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, sometimes you just you just sit it out, right? You only can dance a little bit before you don't do the whole dance. But um. <laughs> You know, just just confronting that again. I mean, and it's it's something that that is very something that is very it's not just scary. It's something that is scary as you approach closer and closer um, to death. But a close friend of mine, he um, he was killed and. You know, I just, I just remember, just remember us as kids. I just remember us in middle school and just, you know, it's like you, you sit back and you think about those days, right? And I remember his brother, his brother, um, brother was Steven. And I remember Steven just had all the girls, you know, like all the girls, like Steven, he was tall and I don't know how tall because Middle school, I mean, we're all short and, you know, we're all short kids. I think he was maybe a year ahead of us or whatever. But but um, I remember I took this girl up on the third floor. And I told I told the story before I, I was I was trying to get in them cheeks, but, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't schooled. I mean, nobody showed me like this is what you do. Well, I mean, like they really didn't you know, like that type of stuff. You you don't know, right? So, and this was, I want to say it was uh, in between class and then uh, somebody came up there, which if nobody came up there, I think I would have, um, I think I just would have, you know, eventually I would have got it. But um, somebody came in, came up there before I could, before I could get in. But um, after that happened, like, remember all the, um, all the older girls they was on your boy, <laughs> like all the uh, the project chicks. One that don't give a fuck. Hey, hey, and say she took like. <laughs> so those girls, like yo, they just like they started to like me uh, openly, and um, I remember one of them was saying a comment, but but they liked Stephen, right? That was his brother, and they liked Stephen. So you know, Stephen was a ladies' man back in the day. And uh, I just remember, you know, us all just kind of hanging out and we would walk to school. We was from up the hill. So, you know, we had to walk down or we caught the bus. Um, but like I remember sometimes I didn't have a bus. I didn't have bus tickets. So uh, so like my closest friends, they would walk. We would walk even though they had bus tickets. Right. So. Um, so that, you know. That, that that's that's the loyalty because it was the trenches you walking down Baltimore City you're a youngster you're a youngin it was uh it was rough especially those middle school days was they wasn't playing you had to walk through all these territories all these gangs and we were just forming our power structure so this was in the beginning and uh like I just, I just remember him. You know, we just walked down and just, just hanging out. And I can just see him now. Oh, and his mother, his mother was so beautiful. I think to me, she was probably the 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 prettiest woman that I've ever seen at that point. Like, I mean, she was just like strikingly beautiful in her body. Like, I, like his mom. Uh, 
for me. She was she was like my number one. Like, and I and the crazy thing is, like I don't even think about, you know, his mom. Far as let's say two months ago, right when he was alive, like I I didn't think of how beautiful his mom was, but but she was. Just as I as I'm remembering. You know, I just I, I just remember her wearing all white. Like I swear, I was in love with. Her. And uh, it's not like I ever went over there, uh, over his house or anything. Um, which I think we went to his house, but we never went in. Like like some of my friends, we knew their their mom, right? So and their mom knew us to the point to where, like, if I if I'm walking out in the street and. I see a, a one of my homies' mothers, and they see me like we're going to stop, we're going to speak, we're going to talk. But you know, I wasn't cool with his family like that. We were cool, me and his brother, and I knew his mom. As far as this is what she looked like, but she wouldn't be like, "Hey, little Bo," and it wasn't nothing like that. Which you know, me thinking now, I'm like man, I really should have like not that anything was gonna happen, but I at least could have been close to the goddess, the goddess of love. Yeah, yeah, she was definitely the um, prettiest woman that I've seen at that time in my youth. Like she was, it was something. It was something to behold, especially like her body. I mean, it was, it was crazy. I, and and I think. Like, no other mom looked like that <laughs> in middle school. Like, no other mom looked like that. And you know how your taste change and you're, you like this, you like that. But but um, his mom was consistently, like, through just through the years. Like, as my vision and my um, palate changed, like his, yeah, his mom was definitely a beast. But... You know, that was our middle school. And we, and we would get into, we never fought each other, but, you know, we would uh, protect each other. And and I remember um, I had the dreads. I was the first one to kick off. Well, I can't say I was the first one to kick off the dreads, but my dreads was uh, the way that people wear them now, right? Because other people had dreads, but it was different because most people back then, they had them based off of like a fade or what we called a, a temple taker. Right now, I'm sure all of these names have changed. They got like Caesar and who knows, maybe just a taper. Um, but those were like popular um, hairstyles. And then you were getting the hot top and then started. Some people started the dreads. And, you know, so we had dreads because I I usually say that I was the first with the dreads in my hood. But I wasn't because I remember before I got dreads. Trying to think because I had I. Did my dreads like um I always wanted them like even when I was just a young tyke but I put I put I, I did my locks and I gotta go with dreads because you know that's that's what it was about it was about that dreadfulness that that D time that DT okay that's what it was about back then and I think a lot of your, as like these righteous and activists get a hold of them, then they want to change the, they want to change the wording because of, uh, I just got to say personal politics, right? You're trying to go into, um, because you like the look and you, you wanted them as dreads, right? The warness of the, of the style. The dark side of the hairstyle. That's what you wanted them for. But you go and you're trying to get a job up in um, wherever. Wall Street. Uh, what is it? Blue, blue collar or white, white collar society. And now you want to call them, you want to like make them pristine and make them glamorous and quote unquote beautiful but but dreads are are still beautiful right but um i mean it's really not it's really not a big thing for me to say all right man dreads 
I don't hold on to it that long, but that's what I use, right? Just like I use black, like I am black. I'm not African American, but for those who use it and like those terms, there's nothing wrong. Like I'm not here to get into a big argument over what you're going to say. Right. But for me, I call them dreads and, um, they had, they had guys who did the rape and I told you about it. And so they all cut their dreads off because the girl wasn't from the neighborhood, but she, she knew, all right, a lot of these guys had dreads. They had dreadlocks. We just called them back then was dreads. So a lot of them had the dreads and that's what she told the police. So that's what the police were looking for. They were rounding people up looking for people in this neighborhood around this way who had dreads. So people started cutting their dreads off. And I'm not sure. I think I, like I had them. I had them during that, during that time, but I really don't recall around that time. Because I, like I said, I started in middle school, but I'm sure it was some others, right? And other, and then I remember like in high school, there was some other people who had them because I, maybe I cut my hair or who knows what was going on, but they always been a part of me, but so I guess I went through periods and times when I didn't have them. But, um, with the homie, <laughs> I remember, you know, so I had the dress like, yo, man, I want my dress yours. You know, so I, um, I hooked them up, you know, I went ahead and, uh, started to twist his hair the way I did it, you know, the way I did it. So I got the beeswax. Because uh, my good buddy Dennis, y'all remember I talked about him. He he was the one who put me on because I wanted the dress, but I didn't really know how to do it. And so he put me on with the beeswax. So I used beeswax and I put and I did my dreads because he had he had kind of dreads like they wasn't fully locked up yet, but they looked like they were because I remember when he took them out. So they wasn't fully locked, locked and loaded. But I went ahead. Like I knew that I was, it was no turning back for me. I already knew that. So the homie cow cow, he, he was like, yo man, I want my dreads like yours. I was like, yo, hell yeah, I do it. So, you know, one time it was one, there was a Thursday, right? It was, it was one time we were all hanging out uh, around my, on my block, Dallas, Dallas Street, 1800 block of Dallas. We all hanging out. So I um, start to start up the, the sequence, the dread sequence initiated. <laughs> and and he kept them and he kept them in, you know. So, so you know, that's that that was something, something special. Even years, even years later, he still had the he still had the dreads that uh, that I started, you know, so. So I started my dreads, then I started his, and that was the only, that was the only one. That was like my only dreadlock son, right? So, so I started the dreads, we, you know, and boom, you know, years later, we go our separate ways, um, has a crazy life, you know? Then, uh, then we catch up maybe 10, I think it was like 10 years ago. And he was doing well. You know, I was just like, yo, man, this dude is getting it in. He was just, man, he was so, he was just doing so well. He was tall, right? He was tall. Like, and I haven't seen his brother since we were kids, right? So I haven't seen his brother in like what? 20, 20 years, maybe. 20, 26, 27 years. So it's been a long time since I've seen his brother. But like I said, I was fortunate enough to see him. You know, I, we met up uh, 10 years ago, and then I saw him, you know, just throughout. We were, we were hanging out. I remember we went out. We went to a uh, to a strip club, and he was just, you know, getting me caught up on – and everything that was happening and it was just like oh you know so 
he, uh, you know, just to hear about his passing, I mean, it just seems so unreal, but, you know, in a city, I mean, that's just, just what it is. But it's still sad, you know, because like I said, I just, I just remember us as kids and, you know, and then for him to, uh, murdered, it's just, but, uh. You know, so that's that. Like I said, I got an uncle that's in the sequence now, but he's doing a dance, but he might not finish the dance. You know, he might sit. Look, man, look, Def, I'm gonna sit this one out. <laughs> but, but it's not. Um, it's not looking good. We went to go see him, and I mean, it was just. Uh, it was just crazy. I mean, it really, it was. You know, just to see a person like that, but on the upside. On the upside, you know, I, I, I just I hope that that I could have something close to that where, you know, family and friends come in to see me and they spend time with me and I get to see him. Uh, I get to see him one last time. And just because he was in his right mind, like he was very coherent, like as far as when you think about um, older people in the hospital and going through the sequence, they, they doing a dance in the pale moonlight, when you think about that, usually they're unconscious or, or they're, they can't talk, even if they're conscious, even like they can look at you, but they, they just maybe like nod their head or give you a smile. But he was, he was very witty, like very present in the moment, right? Very present in the moment. And, and he made a few statements um, like he, like you, like you knew it was t- it was time. And I remember another uncle. This was probably ten years ago. To his his death is very impactful for me because um, because I just I was there, and I remember him saying uh, he tells a story. This was this is we went to go see him, right? So he went to the hospital, and we went to go see him. And he was like, man, you know, I woke up. And, and is this heaven? He thought he died, right? Because I think he uh, maybe his blood pressure went real high and he passed out. So then they brought him to, they got him to the hospital or whatever. And, uh, you know, he was like, man, heaven? He said it was some black African doctor. <laughs> said something to him. He's like, man, this ain't no more heaven. <laughs> He was like, man, shit, like, you know, he was mad, like, man, I thought I was in heaven. So, I remember that, I remember that story, I remember him telling me that story, and and I think he was in, like, the ICU when he said it, and uh, a little bit later, he passed, maybe the next week or the next few days, he passed. He completed the dance. So... You know, now we, we're back in the saddle again and, you know, watching this uncle go through it. And, uh, you know, it's just, like I said, I mean, that, that's really all we could hope for is that family and friends get a chance to actually come and see us and and just look, brush our shoulders off while we're doing the dance. Uh, you in there, right? You in there. But... Before before we even got to this point where, you know, like my, my homie, Cal Cal, where he passed, you know, and I really got to say murdered with this one because, you know, like, man, we, it just, it just makes you just, just really question humanity when, you know, when your friends are getting murdered. I mean, it really does. It, where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? Where? You know? Like, yo, damn. Because, you know, I mourn for my for my sisters that are, you know, out here getting murdered. And for my young brothers who are out here getting murdered. It's like, damn, man. Can't we, can't we all just get along? Right? But... As we spoke before in previous episodes, I mean that that is a part of the human experience is um, is murder, and 
And uh, I remember when I was young, maybe in high school, they were, you know, the older guys would say, you know, humans, humans are the only creatures on the earth that kill to play, um, who kill not out of necessity. So it's humans and uh, young baby tigers, right? Young tigers will kill for fun. Oh, so only humans and young tigers. But but nah, nah, that that's not true. Um, primates, like yo, primates, this is how primates get it in. Like primates are vicious. They are social, but they attack each other and they kill each other. You know, they'll eat your balls. Eat your balls, rip, eat your fingers, your eyes. Right, but they definitely going for the genitals. Like they're going to eat your genitals of their own kind. Like they kill their own kind. Like that is something um, that's like a primate thing. That's a primate feature. And today's episode, we're actually going to be getting into um, like uh, children who remember their past life, the ghost inside of my child. And this is something that I wanted to talk about and I wanted to get into before, um, you know, death. Uh, Came to say like, yo, look, look, I'm out here dancing with one of your people. Come, come watch. Right. So before Def said that, I wanted to do this episode and. And I was going to change it, you know, but I'm going to do it. So I found I found a video on YouTube. So if you guys want to check it out, it's called um, he recognizes himself from a past life. The Ghost Inside My Child, Season 1, Episode 3. So I haven't watched this. Um, I haven't watched this, but we're going to watch it or listen to it, and we're going to just stop and, and deviate. But this is going to be our launching point. This is how we're going to launch. We're going to launch off of, um, off of this because there are a few things, a few, a few um key elements that that are the same in in a lot of these stories right so as we um as we see them and again in this episode we're going to uh to highlight them and question some of the stuff because just like with people who see aliens and you know you just got to question that type of stuff you just do because it's like yo come on man come on man you, you seeing aliens like ah. I, I I just <laughs> look man. Aliens and monsters and all types of shit. Like that. Oh man. Um uh of course it could be true, right? We live in a reality where that could be true, but lying and so many of the mental problems that plague us are stronger than the fact that you could have seen Bigfoot or an alien or a ghost. That's not to say that that stuff isn't true and, and people haven't had some type of experience because this the, these stories kind of reveal something that is um that is unknown like it is is just something unique in these um in these stories so let's go ahead and get into it and uh yeah yeah we we'll, we'll just we're gonna check it out and comment and look let's jump in. Let me introduce you to Bo Miles, a unique and likable guy. Everyday life, friends and family he makes up the artist. Our son Luke told me that he had died and been reborn again. And he said it was a fire. We just jumped out. She said, I'm going to draw you my other mother, your other mother. I thought, oh my gosh, somebody tried to abduct my daughter. I knew that because someone sees something doesn't mean they understand what's happening. I could tell that he was disturbed by something. She was withdrawn she was angry i was at a loss she said i'm not crazy i'm not crazy he was just staring in complete disbelief too 
I started feeling sick to my stomach. I was definitely concerned, didn't know what to think. What I found was heartbreaking. All right, Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati is a great place to raise a family. This is Erica's It's in mother. the heart of the Midwest. I think Erica's there's about 300,000 people. My wife and I met in high school. We went to high school together, and then we went to the University of Cincinnati together. We started a family here in Cincinnati, not too far away from where we both grew up. My husband and Nick and I are pretty open-minded people, but nothing really prepared us for exactly what happened with our whole experience with Luke. When I had Luke, it felt like something that I had been missing forever was now in my life. A firstborn grandchild. The day he was put into my arms was, was a gift. Okay, so I looked Erica into his eyes, mother. looked like Erica. The moment I looked at him, we bonded. It was an incredible moment. Nick was above and beyond excited to have a boy. Luke is a smart kid. He is very vocal. Okay, drum roll, please. He was very, very early in all of his development. He was an early talker. Luke always had a cautionary side to him that we couldn't explain. Most children, you know, they have to learn that the stove is hot from either getting yelled at or touching it and burning themselves. But it's like Luke already knew all those things. Even I am shocked at things that he... The first thing that he would say to me that would make me turn around and, and question what he was talking about is he would say, before I was a baby, I had black hair. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, you were bald until you were two, and now you have blonde hair. You never had black hair. One day I was getting dressed and put earrings on, and he reached up and touched my earring and said, oh, I used to have a pair like that when I was a girl. I remember thinking, okay, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he's just used to me getting dressed and ready in the morning and sees me putting earrings on, and he wants to relate. All right, so already... We're we're getting into we're getting into some 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 delicious stuff right here. Okay, so here we have a, a child who who remembers they remember a lot. Okay, he re, he remembers earrings. He remembers gender. Right, like he at this point when he makes that statement, I re, you know I used to have black hair, and I remember when I was a girl. Like, like at that point, I wonder what's going on in his mind, far as because let's say, let's say that that he truly remembers this stuff, right? Let's say you die and then now you're reborn. In a bit, and you you coming back. You're a new kid, right? And you're trying to figure, out, okay, what's going on? But you clearly remember that you were here, right? And that you died. Like like, what's truly going on in your mind? Now, some of these stories intrigue me because of the the um, the sadness that some of these kids have, right? But a lot of them experience like the same type of death so you know and then we got to remember just like with the um with the abductions with the alien abduct abductions a lot of their stories are the same right so it just it just makes you question like yo what is really going on behind the scenes is it just a parent who is Coaching, right? You just got two parents who are coaching their child and trying to lead their child to remember and to, you know, have this like uh, experience where they flatten with all of these quote unquote memories to to create this moment. Or is this truly happening um, organically? So let's let's carry on. After correcting him so many times and explaining to him that he was born a boy and that he was never a girl, he would still kind of bring things up just matter of factly like oh well when I was a girl I did that and 
You know, when a two-year-old says something like that, you just kind of blow it off. You don't really think anything of it at first. We were sitting outside and we had found a few ladybugs. And I showed him, you know, Luke, look, this is a ladybug. Isn't it cute? I said, well, what should we name the ladybug? And he said, Pam. And I just remember laughing because I'm like, Pam, where in the heck did he get that? He doesn't know any Pams. There's no Pams on any of the TV shows that he watches. I started making mental notes of it just because it started to be a little disturbing. And next thing you know, it happened again. We heard Luke call one of his little stuffed animals Pam. In fact, any time we named anything, if it was a girl, it would be Pam. Why is he saying Pam? Where is that coming from? When Luke was three, it was Valentine's Day, and we were hanging little Valentine's Day decorations in the window. They were little owls that were red and pink. I asked him what we should name one of the owls. Pam, very new. And he said, Pam. I kind of like had like that moment where I was like, I want to know. Now, I do have to say, because uh, I have a friend who worked on um, a really high profile show, right? I'm not going to put the show out there, but he worked on a really high profile show. And he said that, you know, after like season, (laughs) after the first season, it just went to, it it was just a shit show. Like they was just, just look, man, let's just keep throwing stuff on the wall. Like, like at that point after season one, they just was like, yo, this, they didn't even know it was going to be a hit, but it was a hit. So they just started just throwing, just throwing shit at the wall and just hoping that something stick. And I want to say that like, yo, they up on what, maybe season 19, season 20 right now. So I don't, this could be, this could be that type of thing, right? This is season one. Um, but so far so good. Like it's, it's, it's all, you know, cause I can hear some of the writing in in here already like some of the scriptedness where they tell us okay it's uh you know he's always trying to name things pam but then they put something up on the wall or the the window and then they ask him like come on at this point you should already know what he's gonna say why it's always pam who's pam and he looks right at me we got an ad coming he says i I was let's see so we hit mute Skip it. And then well, I used to be, and then I died. And I went up to heaven, and God pushed me back down. And when I woke up, I was a baby. And you named me Luke. All right. Now, again, like, I got I to gotta question the whole God thing. Not because of belief, but because of this is now we have clearly we have um, like they're Christians. So, you know, for, like it just get dicey at this point right now. Some of the other stories that I've heard, they, they might've been Christians as well, but, but there is no, there is no look. They was they went up and they saw God and God, you know, like and then Jesus said, like, it's, it's none of that. It's it's so. So here, this is where. You know, at this point, it gets a little dicey for me. OK. And like I said, it's not because of of belief. It's just once a person like when you got parents talking about God in heaven, you know, it's like. Mm, ah. Man, you know, like, and this is not anything against people who believe, right? I'm not, this is not attack on belief, but let's, let's, let's carry on. Let's see what he, let's see what he, what he got to say. All right, Indiana, PA. My husband, Bill, and my daughter, Willa, and I live in Indiana, Pennsylvania, It's a small town in southwestern Pennsylvania. It's part of Appalachia. It's a coal town. It has a university, though. So it's a a little bit larger than some of the smaller towns around us. There's a news story. I'm Bill, and I'm Willow's father. 
When Willa was born, I was absolutely ecstatic. She was our first and she's our only. We had moved from Rochester, New York when I took a position at the university. Nothing very unusual happened with Willa um, until she was about two or three years old. Okay. I took her to the local park. Lots of kids playing, lots of people around. And did she say something happened Late spring day. I hey, at back. the university. Nothing very unusual happened okay. with Willa um, until she was about two or three years old. Two or three. I took her to the local park. Lots of kids playing, lots of people around. It's a late spring day. I was just sitting not too far from her, watching her. And she was standing looking at a tree. It was a fairly good-sized tree, and there was a, a limb that came sort of out from the side where somebody could reasonably be sitting. And then I could see that she was talking to the tree. And my first thought was, isn't that sweet? She loves the tree. She's talking to trees. <laughs> when we got back from the park, she was drawing with chalk in the driveway, and she said, I'm going to draw you my other mother. And I said, your other mother? She said, yes, my other mother. She was in the park. At first I thought, oh my gosh. So now, <clears throat> all right, here we have this, again, we have this past life. But now we have ghosts. Or we can't say ghosts, but, but we have some like a some type of remnants of a spirit, right? Something we have because all right, we have the the reincarnation. But now you have where the previous mother's spirit is following the the being, right? The child. So this this unlocks and uh, this unlocks another element of reality, right? Where we're saying or we're experiencing in this story that 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 you can like follow a, a being, right? So let's say so um and this is pointing out that that we are we are more than just our physical self, right? And I and I believe that far as like as you stand, you are a lot bigger than your physical body. Far as like your your energy, your aura, your like it's a lot bigger than just the shell that you're that you're in. Now I, I believe that I believe that we are we are a lot bigger and the force or the energy, like there's a field, there's something where, where we're a lot bigger than just this uh, shell that we inhabit. But this part of the story <clears throat> is saying that, that that spirit, that energy, it, it can follow like, like, like we can, we can follow an energy. We can follow and go, and be and know where it is and you know look let me just watch it one last time so if this so if you're if you've passed and your kid has passed you know okay well, he's back in in the body and and they're in uh they're in Pennsylvania now right so that, that that's a new concept but you know look let's 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 listen let's see somehow at some point somebody tried to abduct my daughter Somebody tried to tell her that they were her mother and take her away. I didn't want to frighten her. And I said, well, tell me about your other mother. And she said, well, she was up in the tree. I said, why was she in the tree? And she said, well, she only had one leg. She was bit by a snake and a bad doctor tried to save her. And he cut off her leg, but she still died anyway. And she said, get me down, help me down. And I told her, can't you see I'm little now? I can't help you down. And she told this woman, her other mother, she said, I have to go now. I have a new mother. And she walked away. Now, that, uh, 
this be- because what what could be happening even if the the reincarnation part let's let's just imagine that the reincarnation part happened this could be something that the that the that this mind is trying to cope and deal with because we're putting limitations and restrictions on the spirit world. We're giving the spirit a body, right? It has one leg. It's afraid of heights. It's in a tree. It doesn't know how it got in a tree. Like, like there's so many things. There's so many things wrong, right? And then she says, look, I got a new mother now. So she has to go. So at this point, this this is telling us this story is telling us that that this is a full the fully developed mind that understands like reality far as an adult but it's in a child but the restrictions that it's placing on on this uh spirit right or the, like we we really can't, what do they call it? I don't know if they would call it an aberration. I'm not really sure what they would call it, but we're we're labeling it as a spirit. But for it to help, it's asking for help. Does it see a a, a large spirit? Like, does it see a child? Like, those are some of the things that that I have to say that it doesn't because it asks for help. It's asking, hey, get me, help me down. Right. So at this point, what is what I'm getting from this is that there's there's an adult. But what I'm getting is that this reincarnated spirit. Is still dealing with the traumatic loss of of its mother. Now, I'm not sure if if it's if it was a girl or a boy, but but this reincarnated person is dealing with still dealing with the death of their mother. Right. It remembers, hey, my mom was bit by a snake. They cut off her leg, I guess, trying to stop maybe the venom from spreading or whatever. Or maybe the leg was already gone, but the venom, maybe it had already did too much damage and they couldn't save her and she died. Right. So depending on when it doesn't matter when that happens, but when that happens to a person like that's going to be very traumatic. So what we're what we're hearing is that, you know, this is this was a very traumatic um, loss in this reincarnated persons because now they're imagining only because of the limitations that they're putting on the spirit. That's why I say that, that it's an imagining, like they're uh, imagining this happen, that this isn't real far as, okay, let's say that the, that the reincarnation is real. I don't believe that, that that spirit that's stuck in the tree is real. Right. I, I, I see that as as this person is still trying to deal with the traumatic loss of their mother. So let's uh, let's check it out. When I realized that Willa was actually talking about another mother that she had had, I was shocked. I thought, I don't know what's happening. Willa never mentioned her other mother to me directly. Her mother was the one that she would talk to in more personal ways. I think it could be because I'm basically skeptical of just about everything. And I think Willa sensed that my reaction would be different from Laurel's. I would be more not sure about that, sweetheart. Let's think this through. I know that she has seen something from the look on her face. If I can't hear what she's hearing, I can't help her. And it's very frustrating, and um, it hurts. I knew that because someone sees something doesn't mean they understand what's happening. Still, I would come to question everything. He's our voice in this. All right, we're okay. We're still there. I took our daughter Willa to the local park, and she was standing looking at a tree. And then I could see that she was talking to the tree. Yeah, apparitions. Exactly. Strangely. When we got back from the park, 
She was drawing with chalk in the driveway, and she said, I'm going to draw you my other mother. And I said, your other mother? She said, yes, my other mother. She was in the park. I thought, I don't know what's happening. One day when Willa was about four or five years old, we're driving to school. She's sitting in the, the back seat in her child seat and I'm blabbing to her about her sandwiches and her lunchbox. She's looking out the window and all of a sudden, and she turns to look at me. And I can see her in the rear view mirror and she just looks different. She's still the same child, but her face looks older. And she says completely out of the blue, mother, you must regain the gifts you've been given. She doesn't normally call me mother. At the time, Willa called me mama and my husband, papa. But the word mother never came out of her mouth, except in these instances where she seemed to be somebody quite different. And now, at this point, I have to look at the channel that this is on because this this seems like a... Um, Again, we got, it's like a Christian thing. So I got, let me just look at this channel, which is not bad. I'm not trying to say that this is bad, but, but when, once you start getting into, it's, um, what do they call it? They call it, it's not, it's not agenda. Yeah, that's what they call it. (laughs) They call it agenda, right? Religion is going to have an agenda that they're trying to promote. So you you really have to take that type of stuff with a grain of salt, right? Only because they're trying What's to going on? I was just wondering if you They're trying to um promote, you know, and push a certain thing. So um all right, so no, this isn't this is the the Lifetime Movie Network, so So that's that's not bad. Okay. So all right, all right. Just where you talking about gifts? In high school, we went to high school together, and then we went to the right, University of Cincinnati to together. We he tried to save her, and he cut off her leg. That because someone sees something, d- right, right, I'm with Four him. five years old. Right, here we go. We're driving to school. She's sitting in the the back seat in her child seat, and I'm that? blabbing to her about her sandwiches and her but lunchbox. She She's looking out the window, religious. and all of a sudden, she turns to look at me, so, and I can see her in the rearview mirror. And she just looks different. She's still the same child, but her face looks older. And she says, completely out of the blue, Mother, you must regain the gifts you've been given. She doesn't normally call me Mother. At the time, Willa called me Mama and my husband, Papa. But the word Mother never came out of her mouth, except in these instances where she seemed to be somebody quite different. And she looks back out the window. And I said, what does that mean? What are you talking about? And she looks back at me and she says, what? As if that came from nowhere. Hmm. She has no idea that this is what she has just said to me. And she didn't seem to recall that in any way. Because I didn't know what to say. I was just sort of stunned. She would say things that was just totally out of character with Willa. You must regain the gifts you've been given. I don't know that I was ever worried, you know, anything can happen with a kid. First, I was concerned about the, the whole shift. I can't call it physical. I mean, all right. So here we're introducing like so we're introducing a lot of elements into this. So this this is not just. Someone who is trapped in someone's, like, who has been reincarnated and they are, and they are, like, driving again, right? So they're, like, living this second life. This is something different. This is someone being trapped in in a body. So it's, you can think of it. Like um, those, what is it, Siamese twins, where they're connected at the head. So um, there's a case, and we, we we might get into it on the next episode. 
but they're they are connected at the brain. So two brains have fused together. So what they can do is they can think like one can think and the other one can hear like they can hear each other's thoughts. And I want to say that that one controls maybe one side and another controls another side. But like if one wants to go, if one wants to go forward, they have to get the other one to kind of help with the move uh, with moving the leg or whatever. They got to coordinate the movement of the body. So that's what this sounds like just in this instant, because what what, what happened with this little girl is that we have some type of older being inside of this creature, but it's not a creature <laughs> inside this little girl. So we, we have uh, some type of older human being um, this reincarnated, is in the body, but is not in full control. And there's two of them. It's the little girl, um, which I can't think of her name. So you, I think it's Hallie. It might be Hallie, but we'll, we'll figure it out her name. Right. But, but you have her in there and then you have this other being in there, right? This other, the reincarnated is in there and like they're fighting for control. Like she can only come out certain points at certain times. So that like, that's what I'm getting from this, um, story. So this isn't just, okay, I've lived, I've died and now I'm back again. Right. So this is different. Like this is different. This is, um, but like I said, like it, this is saying that there are two people in, uh, in, in one body. So let's, let's see, let's check it out. It's the same face, but something in the whole personality and the, the, the way that she was speaking mother and the seriousness of this. I did believe that Willow was sending me a message Willow. because there was an awful lot going on. Um, when she was two, I was diagnosed with cancer. The treatment took approximately a year between rounds of chemotherapy, surgery, and weeks of radiation. I was just completely tensed up as if I have no control over my life when in fact I really do. They call yeah, see, so here we're kind of getting the mother is kind of pushing some stuff on to the daughter and kind of interpreting things. So, so that's this is a little shaky. This is a little this is a little on the iffy side, and it's definitely sinking quick. But the father, that's who I really want to hear from because the mother. I mean, she's. Really, She's really bad shit crazy. Like, look, man, I ain't gonna hold you. Like, yo, the mom is is uh, <laughs> she a little on that cray cray side. Got the cancer early. It had not spread, so I was okay. The message really helped me, but I was curious. I was a little unnerved. I'm not gonna say that I thought that she was crazy. I just felt like there were things going on that I did not understand. I link this with the story that she told me about her other mother. And it became increasingly more frightening to me to think about all of this happening right there in front of me. It makes you wonder what is going on with my daughter. When Laurel would explain to me what Willa had done or what Willa had said, I just wasn't sure what to make of it. Just because this is what you perceive to be going on, is it? Nothing very unusual happened for a long time. And then when Willa got older, she came to my husband and I and told us that she was seeing things. I would hear Willa move from her bedroom to maybe use the bathroom at night and hear her say, stop it. She told me that these two little girls, literally, who were ghosts, were actually playing, going boo. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, this is a very, very frightening thing for a parent to have to face. I didn't know what I could do to help her. Cincinnati, Ohio. Our son Luke started communicating at a very Luke. young age, but when he first started saying that he was a woman named Pam, we didn't really know what to think. Luke tells his parents he used to be a girl. His parents become increasingly concerned. 
it was Valentine's Day. Now I wonder how would I deal with that? Like if let's say, you know, one of my kids they um they started to say <clears throat> That they lived this previous life and they, you know, did all of this stuff. Like, I just know the type of person I am. I'm going to definitely kind of see the depth of the knowledge and kind of understand, all right, do they have full control all the time? Or is it this duality that's happening? So I know that I'm going I'm to definitely want to know that, right? Um. I wouldn't think that they're that they're crazy. I would think like, yo, because at this point I would know like, yo, so I, you know, we created this child and now this and I know the things that are coming in. I know the personality of my child. So once they start to talk this, just like that previous father, like I am a skeptic. So I'm going to. I'm going to have to kind of verify, all right, like, yo, what's up? You know, so that's very interesting. Um, let's let's jump back into Luke's story. And we were hanging decorations. I asked him what we should name one of right. the owls. And he said, Pam. Who's Pam? And he looks right at me and he says, I was. And then I died. And I went up to heaven God pushed me back down, and when I woke up, I was a baby, and you named me Luke. He was just staring over, like, in complete disbelief, too. I was definitely concerned. Didn't know what to think. That's the fact, I mean, that's what he said. First of all, I was floored by the fact that he even knew what death was. This is a family that uh, hasn't really introduced religion, formal religion, to these children. I called my mom and I said, hey, you're not going to believe what just happened. Luke just said, Pam was me once. Really? God threw me back down and my, my new mom made me Luke. This was the most incredible thing that came out of his mouth, as far as I'm concerned. Here was a child who, one, had no insight as to what death was even about, and two, had no insight of heaven or God. She's the first one that said, maybe it's like a reincarnation sort of thing, or maybe it's a past life. And I was kind of at first like, Mom, don't go there with me. Yeah, so now, I mean, we can say, like, if the previous life was religion. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't go and see God. Like, so so that's that's not what I'm saying. I, I just want to, I just needed to make sure, which, you know, that's the whole point of this show. When they put it together, they want to set it up to where you, because they know that, okay, people are questioning, all right, is this just, you know, the parents, which we still, we don't know if, you know, if this is, uh, created from the parents and parents kind of, you know, they they put on this whole hoax and they got their son even believing it that we don't know. But we do know is that um, these parents and the guardians, they did not introduce religion. So the kid could, um, <clears throat> could have been right. So Pam, Pam could have been religious. So let's, uh, let's, let's see. Where did the religious element come from? Because um, just the idea, like, we have to shell out agenda. Like, if there is no agenda, then okay, all right, boom, God God pushed them down, right? So, Erica and Nick like to approach things from a scientific end. They really weren't all of that open to the past life experience. It, it's very hard for them to wrap their mind around uh, things unless we can back it up with scientific fact. I don't really know what I feel about reincarnation. I guess I'm, I'm kind of still indifferent on <laughs> reincarnation. <laughs> I really didn't do anything about it. For almost a year, I quit asking him questions. I quit bringing it up around him. I didn't want to put an idea in his head that wasn't already there. So I was cautious to even bring it up. After that, I didn't really want to ask him about it anymore because he kind of seemed like he didn't want to talk about it. So I wasn't going to talk about it. 
Luke was four and we were watching TV and it was something about a bombing and a picture came up with a building and it had a hole blown in the side. And Luke said, I don't want to watch this anymore. I don't want to watch it anymore. This is, this is scaring me. And I said, okay, I mean, we don't have to watch it, but it's okay. You know, all the people that are on the show are alive. Like, it's not real. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, but I died. And I don't like to think about it. It makes me sad. I said, do you remember how you died? And he said, yeah, it was a fire. All right, so here's the first, the first element of a, a lot of these stories. So most of the time they all die in a fire. The ones that, um, that I remember, they died in a fire. Um, one was a pilot in his plane. He got, I think it was a pilot in World War II. He might make it on this episode, right? So I don't know. But he was a pilot and, um, and his, he got hit and his plane caught on fire and he was going down and he was like, you know, screaming and he just like, boom. So, so here is something again. We have uh, a fire. So this is something that is consistent with, uh, with a lot of these stories. They all die by fire. And when I was little, I used to play, uh, I used to play with matches. I used, I had a real, um, fascination with fire just the flames, right? Like not really the burning aspect of it and, or the pain. Um, but cause I remember, I remember I was, uh, like setting some paper. This is the only time that, uh, <laughs> that my mom ever beat me. Um, so I was playing, I was playing with matches and, uh, or playing with a lighter and I was setting pieces of paper on fire and, and then it would, uh, it would, you know, it would catch fire and it would go down. And I would, I would put it out. And, but it's in my like toy chest, which has sections. It probably had like three sections. And I remember that the fire, like I was, I guess it just caught onto some other paper or just something else. And it just got too big for me to put out. And I remember that I just got scared. I was little. I was probably, I don't know if I was in the second or third grade I, i'm not sure which um it had to have been around that time though it had to have been like second to third grade and i remember it was it the fire just got too big and i just ran out i ran out the house i just ran out the house and went around around the corner like so not only did i run out the house like i got far away from the house i didn't say anything like look i'm only uh <laughs> In the second or third grade, you know, I didn't, I didn't know the proper protocol when when you uh, when you playing with matches and playing with fire. So I ran out, and then eventually, eventually, um, I came home. <laughs> Probably like ten or fifteen minutes later, I came home, and uh, I remember my mom. She beat me. <laughs> you know, she was saying, you know, don't play with matches. So, so that was, um, that was my, my thing and my fascination with fire. And I remember, um, what you could do is you could hold a lighter, you could hold the gas on your hand and just kind of let it, um, the fluid, you, you get the fluid on your hand and then you, um, and then you, you light it and then it would create like a, um, like a little burst but I remember one time I held it and I, I had like a lot of fluid on my hand. And when I lit it, my whole hand caught on fire. And I just felt like it was like a cool, like a cooling sensation. Now, I've I've been burnt right before. So, I you know, I know um, how fire feels. But but this time with that with that um, fluid on my hand. It was cool, like the fire. It was it was cool, and then, um, just because you know you're looking at your whole hand on fire, so then you know I shake it and I put it out. But but yeah, I, I, I never I never forgot that feeling, right? So I know at some point because 
you know, the fire, like, it's going to burn all your nerves or whatever. But there is a cooling element to fire. Like, a, uh, it's, it's like... It's like uh, dipping your hand in uh, in cold or cool water, not like freezing water. It, it, it was very weird. So, hey, let's check out this uh, Pam story, how she died in the fire. Well, my first reaction was, are you sure you're not saying that just because you saw that on TV and you're trying to, you know, make something up or play a game with me? And he looked at me really seriously and he said, no, mom, that building was blown up. It hit a hole in the side. It wasn't like that at all. It was it was a fire. He's like, it, it was a big building like that, but it didn't get blown up. It burned down. And at the time, he kind of it made a hand motion that went like this, and he balled up his fist and then made a motion like he was jumping out or off of the building. The building. It's really tall. I We just opened the window then jumped out. I started thinking that maybe it did have something to do with reincarnation. It really disturbed me to the point where I couldn't let it go. All right, so he didn't die in the fire. So, so this is another way. Cincinnati, Ohio. Who's in? All right, Luke. Our four-year-old son, Luke, was convinced that he used to be a woman named Pam who died in a fire. She didn't die. Jumping from a burning building. At that time, was a little shocked at how adamant he was and how descriptive he was. We just opened the window and jumped out. I am not really sure, even after all of this, what I believe. And another thing that is... Um, that we're that we're able to see in this in his story, like because we get we we get a chance to see him and and he's you know reenacting what uh what is going on and he's articulating in his own voice. So it's not like there is a a woman that has full awareness and consciousness. All of her memories are there. That's not what's happening when we see him interact because because he's acting and speaking like a child. And that's not to discredit him, but but what it's what it's showing me is that in this story, consciousness is like driving different vehicles, right? If we think of a game, um and so we think of uh we think of different think of different driving games so you think of uh forza you think of um grand theft uh not grand but gran turismo and then you think of those other uh like grand, grand theft auto and those other uh kitty or where driving is not the focus of the game right so you could be a pro at um at gran turismo Right, whatever the latest one is, or Forza, uh, Forza Five. Like you could be a pro in, in, in or dirt those games, right? You could be a pro at those games and know how to drive and know, you know, boom, and you, and, and you could just play them all, right? But when you play something where where the the controls are not as tight, then you're not going to get the same result. So you have to adjust to to get this car to travel like you have to abide by the laws of the game in the car and that's what this is showing me because even if uh this reincarnation is real right even if it's real and you you let's say you you platinum gran turismo like you've been playing them all you can play all of them you can you can play any car any whatever right you've platinum this you 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 are a master you're in the top 10 of all world drivers when you play and I'm trying to think of like something with a, a crappy driving. I can't even think of any games, but, but you guys can think of anything. Like if you think of, um, like, I don't know, TNC racer or, um, 
uh, I'm thinking of the Simpsons, but I can't really remember the driving. But like Grand Theft Auto driving is not as tight as Gran Turismo. Like because that's not the focus. Now, the driving is good, right? It's still okay. Like it's not bad, but there's some even worse than Grand Theft Auto. So what it's telling me is that, you know, even if you're a reincarnated mind, you're in this little, you know, you're in this car, this vehicle that's that's not there yet. Like it's, you know, you have to grow and mature. So even though you have a lot of this uh, knowledge if you that you could do if you were a certain thing, but you're being restricted by the vehicle. And that's what we're seeing if this little like because if this little kid is reincarnated, just the way he's acting, the way he's talking, it's showing that he has some restriction. Like he's not he's not open. Like it's not just it's not grand turismo. Like so if his parents and his grandparents, because they're very articulate, you could just tell by the background and the way that they're talking, what they have. You can tell that, that, you know, they've they've been educated. The father, I believe, is like some type of analysis. The grandmother looks like she's um, like a scientist or a doctor or or a professor at a at a law school or something. So they they seem very well to do. Um, this kid, he doesn't. So he doesn't seem like he's he he. he whoever's driving this kid doesn't seem like they're 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 playing Gran Turismo or Forza Five, right? That's where what the what the adults look like. Like yo, they're this is Forza Five with them. But with him, it seems like it's um, it's one of those little kitty racers, right? So even though um, he could be, he could be a, a grand champion in, in Gran Turismo, but he's not like that's not the game that he's stuck in. Like he's stuck in some little uh, Simpson game or whatever. So that's what I'm seeing with with this kid as he's talking to us. All right, let's check it out. I would say now, after this whole experience, I, I'm leaning more towards believing that it could be a reincarnation, but it's... And another thing with the reincarnation, like, everyone is not fortunate enough to re- have these memories, right? Because with him, we still haven't decided if there are two people, if there's Luke and then there's Pam, right? Whereas that little girl... Just hearing from the mother, like I need to really hear from the father, and I'm sure we're going to get back to her. Um, Willow, I think. So you know, we're going to hear. I need to hear from the father because right now I'm just like, yo, this is the mother. The mother is just kind of making all of this shit up. But with this story, and it kind of shows when she said that, boom, uh, she says something. Uh, use the gifts. You must use the gifts that are performed on you. And then, boom, she back to a little girl. I didn't see that. I don't know what you're talking about, right? So they're just telling me that there's two. There's two entities. There's two people, two beings, two personalities, dual personalities in there. But with this little boy, I need to see, okay, is there just one? And if there is just one, clearly there's a limitation. So even if you do come back, and then with the reincarnation, everyone doesn't remember. Like, everyone doesn't carry on their memories of a past life and we can you know our brain is powerful we can imagine uh any time setting you know look let's remember your life from uh feudal japan like you've seen enough movies and enough artwork and enough this and enough that to actually come up with a life for yourself so um but this could be different and reincarnation as we're seeing it with just a select few not everyone goes through it is telling us a lot as well let's jump back in still really really mind-blowing to me even with everything i i still don't know so i said well do you remember where it was and he said chicago i knew he was gonna say chicago (laughs) Where, where did you get that and i was like are you sure and he's like i'm sure mom i'm sure my brain's working really well right now i know it's chicago I had asked him if he remembered ever driving a car or driving anywhere, and he told me no. I didn't really take cars. And I was like, well, how do, how do you get around? Well, I would just mostly walk, or and then you could see him think about it for a minute. Sometimes take a train or a bus. So remembering that and then putting that with Chicago, 
made me think, okay, maybe there's some truth to this. I, I've never doubted Luke. He was actually telling us something that he really wasn't able to comprehend himself. I thought to myself, I have a name, Pam. I have a city, Chicago. And I have a means of death, which is by fire. So I figured, you know, She's Chicago's a big city. If there was he said he jumped up a room. fire somewhat recently where somebody named Pam died, I'd be able to find some record of it. So I sat down and I started doing some research on the internet. And I'm sure you could have burned. As I kept finding more and more things that fit, thing. I started feeling a little sick to my stomach. And then I started to get a little scared. It took a lot of research to find the answers. And what I found was heartbreaking. Luckily, you found it. Not, you can't find all these stories. All right, we're back to Indiana, Pennsylvania. At a young age, our daughter Willis started Willis. talking about her other mother. Ah, this is crazy. Willa believes she's you know, experienced in speaking with strange voices. She told us that she was seeing things. I would hear Willa move from her bedroom to maybe use the bathroom at night and hear her say, Stop it! She told me that these two little girls, literally, who were ghosts, were actually playing, going, boo. Now I swear, like, yo, this mom is so crazy that I feel like she's rubbing off on this little girl. Like, yo, this little girl don't have a damn chance, right? Oh, you know, man, this mom is real crazy, yo. Like, is she too crazy? The father need to come and bring and wrap this thing up for me, all right? Because right now, I feel like, yo, the mom is crazy. I don't think I ever felt that she was making it up to get attention. It wouldn't be the kind of attention that a child would want. These reports that she gave me of, of seeing ghosts, they were very disturbing to her. And then as she got a little bit older, she started having memories. It was difficult for Willow because she couldn't block them out. She lost a lot of sleep. She was nervous. Now they're showing a picture. I mean, they're showing her eyes. They look pretty clear. Like, yo, like, they look really, um, really, really like she's she's sleeping. I don't know. Nervous. Uh, she was sometimes frightened for a mother to watch her child being petrified and abused, um, not by um, some child that I could have a talk with or an adult that I could have a conversation with but something unseen. Who could we talk to about this? Um, are people going to think she's crazy? We went to see a counselor at one point, but it was that period in, in Willa's life where she felt that she was totally different from other kids. She looked at the world differently from them. She felt that sometimes they were very young for her. Willa was always uh, sort of an odd kid out. Now, just the fact that we haven't met Willa yet, we've met the other kid, this is kind of leading me to believe that Willa is no longer with us, that maybe Willa took her life, but maybe they're just kind of holding it back and then we're going to meet Willa. So, um, the parents are old and they looked old in these photos with Willa. So it's, um, just this track that they're setting up. I believe that Willa is not going to, uh, physically be able to make this show and she has never really fit in i think she was Bill very isn't. lonely it is very very hard to be a parent and see that your child is different from all of the children around her and knows it and it's also very hard to see that something is happening to her and there's nothing you can do to help well, it was around eight or nine years old when she first asked me about kids being sent out west. I asked her, oh, is this uh, something you're studying in school? And she said no. She began asking questions mostly of Bill about... Now, he said around 10, so she's been really soaking up the mom for like 10 years, right? Because he said, Bill said that that they didn't... She didn't talk to him about a lot of that other stuff because he was a skeptic. So this makes me believe that, you know, she's been really building this stuff up. The mom has been 
kind of nurturing and building and kind of inserting this stuff. So let's let's check it out. Orphans and about wagons and about orphans on wagons, children being sent places. You get one question and nothing for a while, and then another question, and then nothing for a while. I became concerned. Well, at, I was at a loss. I simply didn't know what was going on. She went through a phase when she was, you know, in like fifth and sixth and seventh grade, where it was really kind of a dark period for her. She was withdrawn. She. This is dark for everyone. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not, like, I'm just, I'm not convinced with this one. She was angry, but it wasn't because she wasn't part of this popular group or couldn't do this particular activity. It was more like, where do I fit in this world where we have the living and the dead together? As a parent, I felt helpless. There was nothing that I could do. I might be her mother in this life, but that doesn't mean that I can help her with the other aspects to some other life. This is a time period where she had been dark and nervous and feeling like an outcast and not fitting in anywhere. So school was a place where Willa suffered a great deal. So it's ironic that it's also a place where she finally found answers. She came home and she was so excited. And she said, I'm not crazy, I'm not crazy. And I said, what, what? And she said, the orphan train, orphan train. There was an orphan train. And she was putting it all together. She suddenly realized that some of the things that she had begun glimpsing had a basis in reality. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't craziness. And and these were things that were beginning to come back to her. She actually said, I, I think I was on that train. All right, we're still in Indiana. I became concerned. She seemed to be developing more and more memory of something that I wasn't sure existed. I was skeptical about the visions and the memories. <clears throat> then Willa finds proof. Our daughter Willa came home and she was so excited. And she said, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Huh. <sighs> The thing here is for her to say I'm not crazy and for her to be looking like you can find whatever you want to find. Like you got to remember that people have sex with trees and warm potatoes. So, you know, there's a lot. There's there's a lot. There's a lot going on with this one. Right. Which. I feel like the mom you know, could have been just kind of pushing these and putting these things in her. The relief that she felt was so clear. I mean, she was so excited and so happy, which was unusual for her at the time. And she said, orphan train, there was an orphan train. She suddenly realized that some of the things that she had begun glimpsing had a basis in reality. When you realize that your child has been walking through her life afraid, petrified that she is crazy, and you don't even realize that about her. It's heartbreaking. When she first started asking about the orphan train, I just didn't know for sure what was going on. At the time, I knew that the orphan train existed. Somewhere in some history lesson someplace, I knew that they had sent children out to be adopted. See, here, so the mom... The mom knows about this. I mean, I've never thought about an orphan train, never heard of it, never, you know. But the, this mother has already acknowledged that she has heard about it. And now the daughter is, you know, so, mm, all right. Beyond that, I really had no other information about it. She told us that in class they had talked about the orphan train as part of their history lesson. The orphan train was set up in the 1800s, middle 1800s, and it took children mostly from the East Coast, put them on trains, and sent them out. All right, so here, you know, because I don't want to be hard on this little girl and the mother, right? So here, 
if uh look let's just assume that this is all real like we are doing with uh luke so the 1800s then now we have now so this is kind of saying about time this is this is bringing out elements of time to where all right, are people, are we waiting to jump back in into these different, like, is there a huge waiting list? Maybe because of the population. Look, man, we got, uh, we got two lives coming up on, uh, door three. Man, where is that? Man, that's, uh, <laughs> that's Japan. Ah, uh, oh, man, you got anything in America? Man, America not pop. Look, man, it's like, uh, it's like 2,000 people ahead of you in America. Man, what about uh, what about Afghanistan? Look, man, that line is open. <laughs> like, yo, nah, nah. What about Saudi Arabia? Like, yo, man, can I get a Saudi gig or what? Man? Like, uh, nah, nah. There's like a million people waiting on that thing. You be waiting for eternity. Look, I don't know how long the oil gonna hold up for that for that line. You know, so is it something like that or? And this is something that I thought about for a reason why we don't remember. While we don't remember uh, a previous life, right? Like me uh, personally, like I truly don't remember as far as, you know, when I think back as a kid, like I remember being three. I remember being two years old and climbing up on um, on the counter. Like I remember that and the count and just everything being big, like everything seeming like uh, like the land of the giants. Like I remember that. I remember this dog. It was a German shepherd and it was huge. Like everything is just giants. So I remember that. In those memories, I don't remember um, the the 1800s or the 1700s or the 1600s. Like, I don't remember any of those type of things, right? So that's why I say that I don't remember a previous life. Now, I can imagine one, and um, but that's just my imagination. Running away with me, it was just my imagination. Running away with me. Right. So so I, I can you know, I can use my imagination on these things. But uh, an idea that came to my mind is that e- each reincarnation is not specifically or has to, or a question. Does it ha- does it have to be a human? So if you you boom, you check out when you come back, you might come back as an ant. So if you have these human memories, but remember, just like we was talking about with the car. Where you're, you know, okay, this is Grand Theft Auto, this is Gran Turismo, this is Forza 5. And we just keep going down. This is Excite Bike, right? And, and this is some Atari racer where the controls are horrible, right? So here you're coming from Gran Turismo, and now you got to play on the Atari 2600. But you have those memories of Gran Turismo 7. You have those memories of Forza 5 on a 4K, and then now, boom, you just delegated to the freaking 2600 so you still have to play so you have to focus on the now and not really on the then now boom you you're an ant and who knows how long you make it let's say let's give you a rabbit you're a rabbit and you're so you're developing in the womb right who knows about memory who knows about this when but now you, that you're being born as a rabbit your brain still is developing so even if the spirit or even if the whatever of you knew about you know human life and human existence like you you're still in the system of a rabbit so now you you have to adjust you have to live as a rabbit all of like uh, whatever, whatever is important, like however they perceive, however they go about things like that's how you have to be. You know, just last week you was a human, right? Just last week you was a human. But today you're this baby rabbit. You know, who know, like uh, who knows you might came and open your eyes yet. You still trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe you have these memories. You don't even know what they are. And then all of a sudden a freaking owl comes swooped in. Kill all your brothers, eat you, cut your head off, eat you, right? Boom! Now you're back in a race again. You come back as, uh, as a as a cat. You come back as, as whatever, right? You come back as grass, like you come back. So, 
if you come back as grass or you come back as a tree, boom, now you got to live 200 years or however long you live before you die as a tree. Now, remember, you you was a human or, or let's go. You was a rabbit and then you was a a, a bee and he was all this. And now you're a tree. You about to do 200 years, two, three, four hundred years locked in as a tree now. Then you jump back in and now you're a human after, you know, 200 years as a or three, four hundred years as a tree freaking uh, a couple of days as a rabbit, uh, one day as a bee. Right. When you come back as a human from this long tree life, like oh, you're not going to remember anything because because everything about the tree it's totally different from being a human. So how can you even perceive and interpret that stuff? Like we don't have the proper tools for you to even remember. A lot of us could be remembering life as a tree or life as grass or life as whatever, right? Life is all of these different things, um, but we can't perceive how to even interpret it. And that's how I kind of look at, um, like serial killers and sociopaths. Like I look at them as coming from like, yo, they used to be some type of predator. They used to be, let's say they was a, a, a hyena and not to say that they look, they want to kill people, but we know that, you know, this is a primate behavior. So it's not just that, but, but remember on top of this is a primate behavior, you have, boom, you used to be uh, an owl, right? You was killing. <laughs> like, yo, this is what you did. And now that you're a human, you still want to kill, right? Now, when you was an owl, you, you had the urge to kill. It was a drive, right? We call it prey drive. Some dogs have a high prey drive. Other dogs have a, a high dog aggression drive where when they see another dog, they have to fight. It's just something that's built in them. Others, when they see something smaller than them, they have to attack and they have to eat it. It's just a high prey drive, right? Not all dogs have this. So what we're saying is that not all people have these things. But let's say you, you had a high prey drive, right? Let's say you was a dog and now you're you're a man and that you have a high prey drive. Now, remember, a dog... When it attacks and kills a little creature, it's not trying to eat it. It's not about eating. It's uh, especially like when if it's another dog, like if it's a little dog, when when they have these high prey drives, they don't kill it to eat it. They just they just want to kill it because it's it's just you know. So these are some of the ideas um, far as time, because that's really what we're talking about. Because this girl, she remembers uh, her past life in the 1800s or the 1800s ish, right? Could have been the 17 or 16, just whenever they had this orphan train that she's, you know, piecing together this life. But what's up with time? Because we had little Pam over there. Who knows? We're about, I'm sure we're going to find out when Pam died. But we have Pam and. OK, how long was it before Pam died and then this little boy was alive? Right. So there's a gap in time. So uh, it just it just brings up a, a, a interesting fact about time. This was a deliberate move to take orphans out of the major East Coast cities and send them out to the Midwest where they could be adopted or at least taken in by families. Some of the kids had wonderful lives when this happened. There were other kids working uh, essentially as uh, chattel slaves. I didn't think about this as a past life until she began to say that herself. It's not that I didn't suspect maybe that there might be something there, but I don't think that I put it all together. It didn't come together un until she actually said, I, I think I was on that train. I really just didn't know what to make of it. I didn't think she was making up a story. There's no reason for me not to believe her. Right, so I definitely hope that she's 
uh, still here with us. But I hope that she makes it on this episode and that she's alive because, uh, you know, we haven't met her yet. And she seems like a nice person. So I hope that, you know, she didn't like just check out because she felt uh, misunderstood. So She has come up with some descriptions of herself. A flower dress, but the print isn't too big and it isn't too small. And she was young. She remembers looking up at the man and the woman that she thinks a doctor. She remembered something about the station and what it looked like. She's had memories of a very blonde boy who was also adopted at the same time she was, but he left in a wagon. He had become her closest friend, almost like a brother to her on this trip. And she thinks that that's the reason why she kept thinking about the orphan wagon. She remembered there were hills, low hills. She just started to open up. I think learning about the orphan train at school was a turning point for her. We did a little research and discovered there is actually an orphan train museum, and it's in Concordia, Kansas, <laughs> where they have attempted to gather as many records as possible about the orphan train. We have arranged to have Willa do some research there to see if she can find out. Okay, so they say arranged, so she's still with us. All right, that's good. Anything more concrete about that past life of hers? I'm so excited that I'll actually be able to go to the Orphan Willa's Train Museum. Eight. I well, think eight. it would be a good thing for Willa to go out. She's really interested. She remembers the house that she was taken to, and she hopes that there might be a picture of that, and maybe even a picture of a kid that she recognizes. I feel like I'm having a rare opportunity to go and see a tangible piece of my past, and we'll see if we can find anything really significant all right we're back in cincinnati with luke our four-year-old son luke had memories of being a woman and dying in a fire i felt like it was my responsibility to find something out that could help him. I first decided to do some research once Luke had given me a city, a name, and a means of death. I figured (laughs) if there (laughs) was some kind of a fire in Chicago and there were casualties, that there'd have to be some kind of a record. So I decided to do a little bit of research on the internet to see what I could find. The first thing that I found was all on the Great Chicago Fire, the Great Fire of Chicago. And I found out that there was one remaining structure from that fire, which was a water tower. I found a picture of it and I showed it to Luke. And I said, Luke, does this water tower mean anything to you? And he said, no, no. So I kind of just figured, you know, that was a wrong lead. And I went back and I kept looking more. Well, I thought Pam, you know, is a short name. So I searched Pamela, Chicago, and fire. And I actually got a hit. What I found was in March of 1993, um, there was a fire that was called the Paxton Hotel Fire. The fire was massive, and when the fire department first arrived at the fire, they found people hanging outside of the windows and off of the roof of the building. They had to call in a specialist to identify the bodies. The original newspaper articles all stated that at least one woman had jumped to her death. And the woman was named Pamela. When she found the details of who Luke may have been, I thought it was a possibility, but I didn't put too much weight on it. So I took it a little further and I researched the part of town that the funeral was listed, where the funeral home was, because I figured that was probably maybe where her hometown was. It was a place called Maywood, Illinois. As I read further on about Maywood, I figured out that it was um, a predominantly African-American part of town. I never even thought to ask Luke what color his skin was. Of course, he had told me many times that his hair was black, but I I just didn't cross. (laughs) He knew. Come on, man. He knew he was black. He was was trying to keep that a secret from his mom. (laughs) Oh, man. Like, yo, once he said Chicago, like, oh. Ah, 
God, look, man, I kind of felt he was black. <laughs> let's see what that, uh, let's see what them hips look like. Luke, let's see what your hips used to look like. That's <laughs> my mind. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to think of being another person, let alone like another sex and then add another race to it. It, it just, I don't know why oh, it crossed my mind. Beings. So that night when I was putting Luke to bed, I casually said, what color was Pam's skin? And he said, black. African American skin. <laughs> like he didn't even have to think about it. And what color I was like, are you? Oh, I'm the color African American. Okay, another thing fits here. And it was really creeping me out that here I had a story that was lining up with everything that Luke had told me. But, but, see, this is where the crack. This is this is where a crack comes in, because if you talk to a black person and you say what color is your skin, they're not going to say black. <laughs> Like yo, like that that's not gonna happen, okay? With with color skin, right? Because that's what she asked him. A black person is not going to say my skin is black because their skin is not black. All right, so so that's where mm, hey, let's 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 listen again. So I don't wanna, you know, come down on them, but but like yo, that's a person doesn't say my skin is black. When Nick got here, I had a story that was lining up with everything that Luke had told me. When Nick got home that night, I was very hesitant to tell him up with that creeping me out. All right. Okay, another thing fits here. It was really creeping me out. Like he didn't even have to think about it. So I casually said, what color was Pam's skin? And he said, black. Yeah, yeah, so she said, what color was Pam's skin and he said black nah nah brah nah brah brah little brah brah little loot like yo man like a black person is not gonna say that their skin is black okay that that's not happening so and I'm not even gonna tell y'all what Woody would say because then we're gonna have the next kid if <laughs> this story is gonna you know so look look Luke you I wanted look we're still going to ride out with this. We're still going to ride out, but, but nah. And, and see, this is small nuances that only, you know, that comes from a culture. Like there are certain things that if I was trying to pretend, and I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, clearly something is there. Right. And remember we're working with the, with the architect. So, so now he's, he's driving, Pam is driving, in this and I can't you know I'm not when I say this I don't mean that the family is racist right I don't mean that but but he's driving with a with a car within racism right so I'm not saying that the family they have some type of ill will or they have some type of uh, negative connotation towards black people I'm not saying that but what I what we can see and recognize with this is that this is a white person with a white, um, with a white, how will we say, a white outlook speaking. And so if we were thinking about football teams, right, and you have um, the New York Giants versus the Baltimore Ravens, and you know, the Ravens is going to be more successful, a better team. Um, so, you know, a more winning team, like they win, they've been to the Super Bowl. They got, you know, it's just a winning team. So, so if you have, if you have, um, someone who was, look, I used to be on the Ravens, Right. Let's see, am I gonna make music? Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll rock up. So I used to, you know, I used to be on the Ravens and then um So I used to be on the Ravens and then now I'm on the uh New York Giants. Oh, I used to be on the Giants, right? I used to be on the Giants and now I'm on the Ravens and I'm remembering I'm going to speak, especially if I would, if, if I was like brought up 
in the Ravens culture, right? So I used to be in New York. I used to want to go to the Giants, and I did that, and then I died, and then I came back, and I'm in Baltimore, and I want to go to the Ravens. When I speak about the the Giants, I'm using the language, right, that I – because this is still – it's not like I brought all of my language and just all of my skills. So so that could be something else, right? But, but yeah, yeah, this is definitely – um yeah, that, that wouldn't – like Pam would not say that her skin was black. Like he didn't even have to think what about color, it. What color is your and skin, Pam? I was like, oh. It's black. Okay, another thing fits here. And it was really creeping me out that here I had a story that was lining up with everything that Luke had told me. When Nick got home that night, I was very hesitant to tell him, like, this is going to really <laughs> upset him or I don't know how he's going to take it. But – I went ahead and told him. And his first reaction was, Titties you're crazy. Like. <laughs> when she found the details of who Luke may have been, I kind of just blew it off. I didn't yeah, really think too race. much about and the details. Luke, what race were you? And if you say black. I had to keep showing him and how many things lined up on like every single thing that lines up. And compared with the fact that I had never asked him what her race was, that was kind of like the icing on my cake. I found a few pictures that I believe are of Pam, and I think that I'm going to go ahead and show them to Luke to see his reaction either way. I feel like showing Luke pictures of Pam would be able to put the pieces together for me. And there always could be more evidence. Showing pictures to Luke. Will... Yeah, how do I feel about that? <laughs> oh. Hey, what if he's sexually attracted? I kind of feel that he won't. Nothing will happen. Sure, we'll pay him look good. It's probably 99.9% likely that he will have no idea who that person is. I don't know what he's going to say. He's already exhibited crazy stuff, so I mean, look, he might know. We're back in Pennsylvania. This story is. Look. My name is Willa, and I'm 18 years old. All right, Willa and her parents believe she traveled on an orphan train in the past. Like, see, the thing about this, with this train, is like, yo, that's all you remember. Because well, all right, when you was little, you remembered your mom dying from a snake bite. And then now, only thing you just like fixated on this train, you know. So, ah. I first started having memories of the orphan train when I was quite young. I do remember having the same dream over and over of the little boy. I remember me being a little girl in the dress. I remember getting off the train and seeing him taken away to another family. And I remember my family. And I even started remembering my name. I believe my name was Anna. Well, I decided to travel to the Orphan Train Museum in hopes of finding proof of my past life. Right there. This place looks almost exactly like where I remember getting off the train. This is going to be very interesting. I want to learn as much about my past life as I can because it's still part of me. All of those memories, all the things I did, all of those experiences, they're a part of who I am. Even if I don't find any definitive records of Anna, I'll still be able to just see the other children who were like me. And I really am ready. Is there anything you want to tell me about your experience, your memories? I remember a lot of the kids had already been adopted off the train, so I would have been in one of the later states, Kansas or Nebraska. Okay. I would be about eight to 10 at most. And I believe my name was Anna. This is a list of all the Annas that we have files on. 
Okay. And if there's any names that jump out at you at all. This one. It had an R somewhere in it. Can we look at her? Anna mm -hmm. Ruth. Okay. Let me see if I have a file here on her. It could have been Anna Reed, too, but there's an R. Okay. So I was able to find limited information here. Uh, Anna Reed, all we have is that she was placed in Kansas. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any pictures in here. But there is limited information about Anna in this file, if you'd like to go through that. All right. I wasn't able to pinpoint exactly which Anna I was. I mean, there's a lot of missing files. I can make up a list for you of the towns they stopped in Kansas, and we can start researching the newspapers uh, during those time periods to see right. if there's any names you jump out at you. I think I'm much closer to finding my Anna. Seeing everything, seeing the suitcases, the dresses, the pictures, the trains, it brought everything from a memory to the very front of my mind. I have real places to start now. I have the orphanage. I have the general area, the general time. And I think with that, I have enough of a starting point so that I can go out there and find my Anna. Anna was not able to find Anna. She returned home from the museum. A few months ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And obviously I'm now in the process of being treated for that with chemotherapy after surgery. After 17 years of being clear of cancer, to be diagnosed with breast cancer again really just knocked me flat. When I was diagnosed with cancer 17 years ago, all I could think about was that I was going to die. But I don't think about it the same way anymore. Yeah, cancer is... I don't think it's the end because it's not the end. Well, I have a child who was found by her previous mother. What it makes me realize is that you don't lose contact with the people you love. I believe that you can continue to find those people who have been important to you over the course of your life in another lifetime and another lifetime and another lifetime. It's not nearly as frightening to me as the first time around. Contrary to what a lot of people would say, I don't think you can prove there is or there isn't continuation. Right. But just that thought that the family can go on so. even yeah, after so. death, right. it makes you feel good. The prognosis is very good for her, but I have this feeling that if something were to happen, right. that I wouldn't really lose her. She'd still be there, even if it wasn't in a physical state. Yeah, that's a step. All right. And Cincy, the natty, back with Luke and Pam. AKA From the time Pam. that my son Luke was two years old, he remembered being a woman named Pam who died in a fire. Okay. Once I had identified Pam as a real person who actually died in a fire, just that name. I didn't Why really know what to on? do like, with yo, that Pam? information. Like, yo, I found a few pictures that I believe are of Pam and I think that I'm going to go ahead and show them to Luke to see his reaction either way. Whether or not we have the right Pam, if there is a Pam, it still leaves me with a lot of questions as to who Pam was and what happened. I feel like knowing for myself would let me help him with these bad memories that he actually does have. All right. You want to look at these pictures? And just what we're talking about memories, like you can have someone else's memories. But, you know, he like that, the girl, Willa, she, it's not like she remembers the whole life of, of her, you know, of her pre or her previous life. She just remembers, okay, it was a train and... 
is an orphan train, right? So, but she's not remembering her whole life. This kid is remembering the death, right? This is going to be um, the most traumatic part of this uh, of of the life, right? The timeline. He remembers the most important part, which, or I can't say the most important, but the most traumatic, right? They, he was in a fire and he jumped to his death. Um, so that's going to be very traumatic. So he remembers that. Um, I'm not really sure he really remembers anything else, but there have been others and we might do a part two, not next week. Um, but we might, we might do a part two for next week because look, this is something, there's another story that I like and that I want to, um, to kind of, you know, go with this. I think we will do a part two of this. Um, and I'm gonna look for the story is, is a pilot. And uh, like he remembers a lot. He actually goes and and goes back to the family. Right. Which I'm not discrediting anything that we've uh, listened to so far. You know, like, look, man, uh, why not? <clears throat> yeah. All right, let's see. Do you know who any of those people are? When we were looking at the pictures, I knew which one was Pam. The rest of the images were not Pam. If you think you know any of those people or if any of those people look familiar. <laughs> What's familiar mean? Like you know them from somewhere. <laughs> You've seen them before. You know what? someone I can recognize. Especially if he said that, you know, he said that he was Pam, right? So if he has all of these memories, why wouldn't he know what he looks like? But again, when we go back to our, when we were saying about the, um, the car, right? You're not in a grand, you're not playing Gran Turismo. You're not playing Forza 5 anymore. You're playing Excite Bike. It's gonna be uh it's gonna be hard to describe using the language of, of excite bike to describe um three D, right? So uh, so you know we gotta we gotta take that into consideration. If you're in excite bike, it's gonna be hard for you to describe three D graphics and photorealism, you know, to the world of excite bike. Like they like what what are you talking about? This is real. Like like yo, this is not real. This does not like I'm telling you, it, it looks better than this. And they're like, I mean, but but what do you mean it looks better than this? So so you know I can understand why it would be hard, right, to to um to really see yourself in the to like instantly know, boom, here I am. Because you now you're in um you know, we're just talking about the language, the way that he's communicating his brain power is like is like the Atari twenty six hundred. Even if he has the knowledge of so Pam. So. Why well, would he say that's me? He looked right, right at the correct picture. He said he recognized that one and that um, he remembered it being taken. But it was the other time. It was the other time? Yeah. It was pretty powerful that he picked out the picture. Um, can't really explain it. I don't really know. <laughs> kind of bewildered. I don't, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't really know what to think. I guess it does make me, you know, strengthen the, the possibility that maybe we found the right Pam. We'll go upstairs and play. I love you, okay? Upstairs and play? Yeah, I love you. <laughs> Alright, he's living. Luke is very excited about starting kindergarten. <clears throat> he no longer speaks about Pam or the fire. That's something consistent. It's important to me that Luke understands that he doesn't have to worry about fires around every corner or, um, you know, dangerous things. He does have another chance now as Luke. I feel like I'll be able to help him more with his questions in the future, knowing that I know what happened now. And it's not just something that he has to deal with alone. All right, so let's see if we can find this pain that they're uh, they're speaking about. 
So we'll get that. Let's see if um you know we'll go to Google. <sighs> Google and then we'll see. Um see if we can find because like we could see a blurred image. Um so we'll just do Luke the Kid. Okay. Who who remembers past life, right? Boy Luke remembers life as a woman. All right. So this was in 2018, Ghost of My Child, um, season one, episode three. Okay. Let's see. This is on the Huff Post. Let's see if they bring up the kid. Boom, here she is. Pam Robinson. Her skin is definitely not black, buddy. So But like we said, it's you know the vehicle. So um so let's see if there's anything else. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Um, but the facts have a habit of getting in the way of good stories. Okay. So yeah, we know that the producers had to kind of, you know, kind of get things going and put it on a track that's ready for um, for episode. So, uh, so that's that's not bad. That's not bad. But uh, her name. All right, so the Robinson family declined to comment on the story. All right, let's see. Um, His mom was baffled. She investigated further and found that Pam Robinson was one of 19 people who died in the 1993 hotel fire. Robinson family declined to comment on the story. Hmm. Let's see. All right, let's, let's search that up. Okay. Pam Robinson... Um, so we're going to look up, uh, Pam Robinson hotel fire and what is it? What is it called? The hotel? What? Uh, let's see, Wendy, but, uh, Pam Robinson, I one of the whole, yeah. So that's what we're looking up. Pam Robinson hotel fire, Chicago hotel fire. So let's check it out. All right, Pam Robinson, Chicago, ooh, Chicago Fire, 1993, boom. All right, she was an African-American woman who died in the fire. She died after jumping. Uh, let's see. Faulty space heater set a room on the first floor of uh, fire. Yeah, that's, man. 130 residents got trapped, I think 19. 15 was killed. That's bad, man. Uh, 14 was killed, more than 25 injured today. Let's see, the fire spread so quickly. Uh, Pam Robinson. Two-year-old said that he was her. Who was Pam? Jumping through a window to escape the inferno. All right, let's see. Uh, Let's see, a Pam... Robinson family member told Erica that Pam Robinson was a black woman. Had enjoyed listening to Stevie Wonder's songs. She played the keyboard a lot. Luke, as an infant, had a piano, had a little piano. It was his favorite toy. Also, He also enjoyed Stevie Wonder era music. <laughs> Luke, after the age of five, stopped talking about Pam. All right. Well, I mean, you know, look, this is definitely... Um, Luke's story tells us that the human life force or soul has no gender... Social or racial identity. All right. So let's see if we get anything else. He's a take his black and white sheep dog. 
So these are just more stories. Let's see. Uh, this is Robert's son. So this is something else. This is another story. But but the... um. So the mom talked to someone in uh, Pamela's family, right? So after five, he just boom, he just let it go, and that's what you find out. Like, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna do another one. Uh, this the Pam Robertson. Let's pull her up, pull images up of old Pam Pamela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pam was beautiful. It was a beautiful woman. Man, that's just so sad that she had to check out like that. But she was a beautiful woman. She definitely, uh, her skin wasn't black, though. You know, so that that's the only thing that, um, that's the only issue that I have with this. But like we said, he's just driving through the, um, he's he's just using the, uh, the language of excite bike even though and we're you know trying to listen and interpret it as um as forza five or gran turismo eight or whatever number they're up to now so so that's that um let's see any takeaways from that i think that um we're, we're gonna hang around here again so next week we're gonna we're gonna do uh two more right because I, I definitely want to do the pilot his story is interesting because he actually they take that kid back and go and speak with the family, right? The survivors. So they do that. And that kid is older and they interview him. I think he was on one of these um, shows, right? So I'm not going to give what happens in it, but that happened. So we are definitely um, going to explore to ex keep exploring this topic. Right? So I thought this was very, um, and I, like I said, I was thinking about it even before, um, before I got hit with um, with uh, watching Death Do Its Dance one more time. Because I mean, we all have to dance with it. So I mean, it's it's scary, but at the same time, it's uh, it's inevitable. So I want you guys to have a great great week. As far as the YouTube stuff, uh, things are looking good. The the Nightmare on Elm Street um, project is um, Project Freddy is is coming along, and we we got some images. I think I'm gonna start posting those images. I just don't know what platform. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. Maybe I might do it on Instagram. I might do it on Facebook. Like I'm not really sure. Maybe I might even do it on YouTube, right? Um, so I don't know how I'm, how I'm gonna do it. But I'm gonna once I get more images up and really get the atmosphere then i'm going to start creating that um to kind of build awareness so i think i might i don't know when i'm gonna do it i know it's going to be closer like once it's finished and leading up to the actual um release of the of the project so so that's all good hope you guys have a great week reese's welcome back Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Look, man, let's go ahead and play that, man. Look, we got the tube up. We might as well go ahead and play the welcome back song. That was a uh... <laughs> sport. <laughs> Same old place that you laughed about Well, the names have all changed since you hung around But those dreams have remained and they've turned around Who'd have thought they'd need ya? Welcome back.